we look at hundreds of companies with network effects and we work with them all the time. When you see those patterns replicating in the companies and you see that by setting up these network effects, you almost create near destiny for the companies. Once you see that over and over again, you start to see the same patterns in people's lives. In our investigation of how these how this network math applies to your life, we've noticed that there tend to be about seven big inflection decision points, these crossroads that you reach. But once you start seeing it as those crucible moments when you're setting up new network and those networks are going to have this impact on you for many, many years, you start to see those decisions quite differently. You start to think about navigating those decisions and those crossroads moments quite differently. So these are the five elements that help form networks in your life. And you can almost measure network formation in different stages of your life by these five things. And at different stages, you're gonna notice different emphases of different elements of this. On frequency, it's sort of intuitive, but the more frequent you interact with someone, the stronger the bond is gonna be. College is the same thing. You're frequently bumping into each other, learning more about each other, deepening that relationship and that trust level helps to form strong bonds. Work can be the same way. So a note on density, it's really all about shared connections. So let's say, for instance, you know 15 people that all know another person, but you don't know them yet. Eventually, you're probably going to know them. The other thing about density that you'll notice is sometimes you see these clicks, right? Well, all that's really happening there is that a small group of people who kind of all know each other, and eventually everyone in that area gets to know each other. So every node is connected to every other node. And when that happens, that looks like a click and you can feel it. You can intuitively see that they're a group and that's mathematically what's happening is it's getting closed off because they all have that same property of knowing all the other nodes in that cluster. So the node on identity formation is really that there are certain moments in your life when you're open to the idea of defining or adding to or redefining who you are, like how you want to navigate. And if you go through one of those crossroads or crucible experiences with someone else, you're open to bringing them into your network and including them in the sense of who you are. And so that is another moment in time which deepens and broadens those links between you and other nodes in the network with other people. So proximity simply increases the chances you're going to run into them. And that does two things. It increases your frequency and it typically increases your density as well. But most importantly, what it does is it lowers the friction for the chances for you to interact with them. So it's a combination of both the cost, the friction, as well as the benefit as we navigate through our world. So with difficulties, what we mean is share difficulties. So if you're working with other people on a project or you're going through something hard, you're just open to bringing those people in to your identity, to what you've accomplished, to what you're proud of, and making them a much stronger node in your network. So these are the five elements that help form networks in your life. And you can almost measure network formation in different stages of your life by these five things. And in different stages, you're gonna notice different emphases of different elements of this. So as we use network math and network thinking to try to explain the world a little bit better and understand it better, it's pretty interesting to notice that there's basically three network levels all interacting with each other that exist in this world that we're all part of. And the first one has been around forever, which is the physical world, okay? You have a physical network. If you have these, these cities, you have these streets, you have gas lines and electric lines and water mains, you have cars and offices and lights. This is all the physical network and this drives proximity. This drives density. This drives frequency. This drives identity formation. All the things that do network bonding, there's a physical infrastructure in our world that changes how our networks function around us, okay? And on top of that, we have a social network, right? So it's people. We have a network between people, how we're talking, who we know, who we identify with, and those people live in our physical world. Uh, that is also another network, and it has its own functions uh, between the people uh, as network nodes there. Now, what's interesting is in the last 25 years, we suddenly have this very broad but much thinner sort of digital world this digital network. And this gives us much more breakdown of time and space than these do. Uh, this gives us access to network nodes we never had access to before. For all of us, I think we've been watching and wondering for the last 25 years, how is this really gonna change what has been a pretty static world for a long time? And we're just starting to see the changes that this is making. For instance, about 40% of all marriages in the US are now coming from dating sites, which exists up here. We do know that things could really start to change here in terms of access, in terms of equality, because of this different layer that now exists in the digital world. And it's gonna take 75 years to play out, but that's one of the reasons I think we're all excited about it. Every system, every complex dynamic system, all of these are and all of this is one together and we live in one, right, is being driven by 
efficiency. How efficiently can it operate? Like if you have a road or an office, if you're in an office with someone, that lowers the friction, lowers the effort, and makes it more efficient to interact with certain people, which then builds out who's in this network. And then people on this network might suggest for you to jump on certain uh, digital networks that allow you to connect with people there. You've got a balance between benefit and cost at each of these levels, and Every network is making its own calculation and influencing you to basically go the path of least resistance with the greatest gain. So as we think about network math and network thinking, one of the interesting things about our personal networks and our people networks is that we are structured and limited by how our brains are structured. And a researcher named Dunbar came up with Dunbar's law in the 90s. Many of you have already heard about it, which is essentially we can know about 150 people and interact with them on a regular basis. And beyond that number, homo sapien, we have kind of a difficult time really keeping strong ties. You can feel that. In fact, we've seen a lot of corporations grow to 150 and then have real troubles. So they grow to 150 and then they create another office that grows to 150. And that's actually a strategy based on Dunbar's number. What's also interesting though is that there's some concentric circles inside of that number. Often, you're going to end up with about 45 people who you know quite well. This is sort of your clan, this is sort of your tribe. If these are familiars, okay, these people are familiar to you, you recognize their face and know their name when you're in the office, you then have acquaintances where you know a bunch about them, you can remember something about them. And we can handle about 45 of those. Within that, we've got what we would call friends. And typically, people are looking at about 15 of those. People who they really know well, they trust, they rely on. Beyond that, it's hard to stretch your friendship, your deep friendship barrier uh, past that too far. And then within that, you're going to have about five people who are family, uh, who you have the strongest ties with, who you rely on for your, your deepest things in your life. And this apparently is how we are structured. What's interesting is that each of these numbers is about three times the other. When you understand how your brain is structured a little bit and the network math, this plays into how the rest of your networks actually play out. So a great example of network math and network thinking is to think about a dinner party. If you're gonna have a party, you have to think how many possible two-way conversations could there be? The formula for this is n times n minus one divided by two. And if you have six people, it turns out that this is 15. 15 independent two-way conversations could be there. That's a lot of conversations. If you wanna have one conversation, and have sort of an intimate dinner, you're, what you're gonna find is that you need to suppress 14 of these conversations. This is why often if you wanna have one conversation, we just have an intuitive sense that we probably shouldn't have more than six, maybe eight people at the dinner table, because otherwise it's gonna get out of control. And so that's our experience of life. That's our experience of these dinner parties. And we've intuitively understood this is the size that can often mean for an intimate, wonderful dinner gathering. So imagine if there's 10 people at the party. So it's 10 times 10 minus one divided by two, which is 90 divided by two, which is 45. 45 independent conversations if you wanna have an N of 10. This is, this is obviously geometric growth, right? The number of conversations you have to suppress in order to have an intimate one conversation dinner goes up dramatically as you increase the number of people at your dinner party, which is why typically we don't do it if we wanna just have one conversation. But this is the network math behind it. And when you start to see how each of us is a node on a network and how math is sort of working on us, it starts to help explain why things are happening the way they are in the world a little bit better. So the seven crossroads uh, moments are the family you're born into. And of course, you don't have a choice on that, and yes, that's not fair. It's not fair which family you get born into. Your reaction to it could be quite different, but um, your family sets up your foundational network because those are the people you're gonna know your whole life. Those are the people who, as nodes in your network, are gonna influence a lot of your decisions over time. The second thing would be high school. And you're building a large group of friends there. You're, you're, you're figuring out your identity, you're really bonding with those people, they're gonna give you ideas, they're gonna give you assumptions, they're gonna give you ways of thinking that you didn't necessarily intend, but you're gonna absorb those and that's gonna become part of who you are. But the third one, of course, is college, and this is the one everyone talks about, in part because of the, the biological point we're at. It's a unique moment where we're kind of fully grown, but we're still really forming in terms of how we think and who we are and, and the language you use to describe ourselves in our lives and who those relationships are. There's a lot of firsts that take place in your life during that 18 to 21 year old period. So college is an important crossroads. The, the fourth crossroads is really your first job. 
there's an inherent choice you're making with your first job about where that job is too. So you're actually making a geographic choice when you make a, a job choice. And a lot of people might make their decisions based on the skills they'll, they'll earn or how much money they'll earn in their first job. Probably shouldn't be the first priority. What should be the priority, again, is the network. What network are you choosing when you choose that first job? It sets up your, your initial connections that are gonna lead you to your future job opportunities. It sets up your initial skill sets that will teach you how you think about working outside of the academic environment. And those patterns in you end up replicating for a long time afterwards and will only change with a very structured uh, shift that takes place later that you'd have to do yourself or something else would have to happen. So the, the fifth one would be sort of a life partner, uh, getting married or choosing to have a life partner. That person has their own network. You're merging your two networks. That person has a whole, is going to be with you so intimately and in how they think and what their assumptions are and their ideas and their aspirations will then become part of your way of life. And so merging your two networks ends up having a very big impact on you. It's also the case that this person is going to be the one who has children with you, potentially, if you're going to have children. And when that happens, your children's networks become part of your network. And all of their friends become part of your network. But the parents of their friends, particularly when they're under 18, become part of your network. Sometimes... Those are serendipitous moments because you're standing on the side of the soccer game or you're going on a road trip for the school and you're spending a lot of time with these people you didn't really choose but that your children chose through their friendships at school. So suddenly your network starts to splinter in ways that aren't of your choosing and are going to have impacts on your jobs or who you know or where you travel or what vacations you take. So all these relationships and all these network nodes in your new network are going to impact your life as a result of who you choose as a life partner. The sixth one would be where you live. This might be as big a decision as any of them. And this might be taking place when you get your first job. It might even be taking place when you choose your college. If you choose a college, let's say in Connecticut, all the people you're going to meet there might end up with jobs in New York and Boston. You might end up in that part of the country. You might find a potential spouse at that university and then stay in that area. So the seventh cost roads, it's just reassessment. At any time, you know, because we do have free will and we're talking a lot about how network effects or networks and the nodes within those networks affect your life and sort of drive you in certain directions. Of course we have free will. All these networks do is put the data on our dashboards. We're walking through life. We're, we're reading our dashboards. We're making our own decisions. We do make our own decisions. We do have free will, but the math that's on our dashboards is being put there by the networks we've already chosen at these, at these crossroads. So yes, we have free will. And at any moment you can say, wait a minute, Am I in the right path? Is this really who I want to be? Is this where I want to live? Is this what I want to be doing? And you can reassess. And when you reassess, think the greatest way for me to change anything about my life is going to be by introducing myself to new people, to new nodes, to new networks. Think of it that way and you might make better and more lasting and more effective decisions than by I'm going to earn more money or I want to go where it's warm or something like that. Find the people you want to be with find the activities you want to do and inject yourself into those networks if you can figure out how to do that and that's a reassessment and that can take place at any point in your life it could happen in the middle of high school it could happen when you're 85. so as we go through life trying to live the best most impactful lives we can it turns out that the most effective and lasting way to change yourself is to change who you're surrounded by and since the power of networks so influences us the most effective way to change yourself is to change your networks.